focusing is much easier than not focusing, although the mind seems to think that focusing is hard because I have to exert myself. But it's only hard in the beginning because the mind wants to do whatever it wants to do without being restricted, but it's actually not happy in that state. I'm not satisfied because it doesn't have a place to rest. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Vyavaseyatmakabhuti, aka hakurnandana. It's much better to focus in one place, to have one spot. Tasmad ekena manasa bhagavan satvatam pati. The Bhagavatam says, therefore, after listing the anomalies of the material world, one should have one focus, one clear place to put the mind. And also Bhagavatam says, Swayam, uh, okay, I forget that verse right now, Swayam Bujaksha, Akila Sattva Damni, uh, that uh, one should be in Samadhi and focus in one place on Krishna. And of course, Krishna says, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto, I recommend you think of me. And it's not unreasonable also because Krishna is the, the one person where we focus our mind upon him. He's fully available to us, actually, in all times, all places, and all circumstances, because he's unlimitedly dimensional. He's in every atom. Ekopya sora charitam jagaranda kotim yat shakti rasti jagaranda chaya So the idea that I'll be more satisfied wandering is simply a, uh, the undisciplined mind. And it doesn't help us in any way. It, continue, it, it, it continues our wandering state. That is the mind being free to go wherever it wants. Just a, a personal experience that I've had is that it takes a little concentration and determination to come into a focused state on chanting. However, once I cross into that state, then I feel satisfied because the mind's no longer wandering from one place to the next. It doesn't feel dissatisfied. On the contrary, it feels like, oh, where have you been all my life? I wish I was always in this state. Well, how could I ever leave it? I don't want to stop doing this. Whereas in the wandering state, the mind's going like, is this all you got? And any opportunity, somebody coming over to tell me something, I'll think like, oh, good, good, good. Come on, give me a reason to stop this. <laughs> the mind's like that. So the swadhyaya, or the daily practice of examining oneself and seeing how one can discipline the mind to think of only the vibration of the holy name is vital for progress in life. If we don't have that, then it's difficult to actually explain why we're even here. We simply move from one idea to the next. Here meaning existentially why we're even alive. We have no really real strong purpose. But in one second of realizing the connection between us and Krishna through chanting with a completely focused purpose and purposeful mind, then we sense this purpose in life and also the connection, the yoga we, we have with Krishna. So the practice of japa in a very uh, determined and um, purposeful way is, is vital to uh, real spiritual advancement, which is not something that means I'm just part of something uh, in name only. It's not that I label myself, I'm a this or I'm a that, some ism, but it's a, it's a real connection that we have with our, our source. So we have to have that. And minus that, we're aimless, or even worse, we, we feel cognitive dissonance that I say I'm this, but I, I actually don't have the experience myself. So this is one of the reasons that uh, <clears throat> it's so much, um, the acharyas advise that you should 
do this. You should take time to make sure that you get into this clear state of yoga. And the best way to do it is by chanting. It's a recommended process. Etan nirvidyamananam, ichatam akatobayam, yoginam nirpaniritam hayar nam anukirtanai. Quote that verse a lot nowadays because I realize that uh, Shukadev Goswami is saying that everyone's behind this. There's not, he's saying there's not one acharya who doesn't agree with this process. And so you can go do the research yourself if you want, or you can accept Shukadev Goswami's declaration that just believe me, everyone says this is the process. And that gives a sense of concentration itself that it's okay. It even looks good, the whole image of somebody uh, sitting in one place and focusing it. And intuitively, it seems like, yeah, that, that makes sense. There's something deep inside that we can bring out. But it's without chanting, without having the connection with the higher vibration that comes from the spiritual world, which we can talk about, the tattva and everything. But without, ha without that, it's very difficult to actually enter into that state. We have to have something positive to meditate on. And that's the vibration of the holy name and remembering that the holy name is a person. There's no difference between the person and the name. Om Tat Sat. Thank you very much for listening to my monologue or diatribe, as the case may be. Let's try it. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakti Hare Krishna. Just take a f couple minutes for reflection. One thought about chanting and sambandha gyan. Sambandha means exploration of our relationship with Krishna, which is quite simple. He's our maintainer and well-wisher. We're part and parcel of him, and we're his appreciator. We're the maintained. And our only job, really, is to appreciate him, and because of appreciation, then spontaneously serve. When we appreciate somebody, then we think, like, what can I do for you? And that's how simple it is. The materialistic mind thinks in terms of survival, because when I'm a material body, I have three psychological defects. That's raga, bhaya, and krodha. And raga means which is the root cause of the problem, is I have a sense that I have an intrinsic relationship with the material world. And I become deeply uh, invested in the objects of this world. Bhaya means I have a fear that if I don't work really hard, I won't survive. In fact, I... Jivo jiva sajivanam. I, I even to the point I have to kill other people in order for me to survive. And also I have a sense of fear because of not understanding my identity. And therefore I, I have a fear of facing a personal identity. And Krota means anger because of confusion, of not having any resolution about who I am. So it's important to be able to chant Hare Krishna to, to establish what our relationship is, that it's okay to just be an appreciator. I mean, what use is chanting Hare Krishna? After all, you're just sitting there. What are you doing for anybody right now? How come you're not feeding the poor? How come you're not cleaning something or doing flying an airplane or doing something useful to the world? Well, because you don't necessarily have to. Because you may spontaneously do that because of a sense of, uh, I want to do something for Krishna. But Krishna doesn't mind if we sit here and chant because we're in our constitutional position, which is that Krishna's my source, I'm part of him, and that's okay. That Prahlad Maharaj says this when Nishringadev orders him to take a benediction, and he says, no, I don't really want one, because I'm satisfied that 
I'm your servant, you're my master, and that's it. It's fine. And that's our relationship. So it's okay to chant Hare Krishna, but until I have this resolution cleared in my mind, clear in my mind that actually I'm an appreciator and I can sit here as long as I want and just appreciate Krishna, and that's fine with him. And it's, it fits into the universal scheme also. It's not going to ruin anything. It's not going to mess up my chances for getting ahead in life. In fact, I only get ahead in life when uh, Krishna uh, paves the way. And that's all he does for us all the time. He's our ever well-wisher and supplier of everything. So why not just sit here and chant? In fact, there's a prayer in which Madhavendra Puri talks about, okay, goodbye daily duties, goodbye family responsibilities. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. I'm just going to sit here and worship Krishna through chanting the holy name of the Lord. And this is a, a point of, of to come to uh, from cultivating this understanding of my relationship with Krishna. So it's very much necessary. Otherwise, as soon as I sit down, the mind will say, get up and feed the poor. Get up and fly a plane. Row a boat. Do something, but don't just sit there. So let's just take a few reflections from any of the points from this morning or something, a realization that you have. Nagar. Thank you, Guru Marsh. <clears throat> As, uh, I, I really appreciated what you were saying when we, before we were chanting earlier about the relief that there is by just focusing and that the mind is in so much anxiety all over the place but when we actually give it a place to rest and to focus, then there's so much relief. And um, I was reminded of a verse in the Mukundamala Stotra, where King Kulashekar says, <clears throat> The desert of material existence has exhausted me, but today I will cast aside all troubles by diving into the lake of Lord Hari and drinking freely of the abundant waters of his splendor. The fish in that lake are his brilliant shining eyes, and the eight waves are agitated by the waves his arms create. Its, flow, its current flows deep beyond fathoming. And uh, I just, I really appreciate that, that point that, you know, it's just a simple matter of applying our attention and then that relief is there. It's like an ocean of, it's like an ocean of relief. The holy name is like an ocean of relief. And it's, uh, you know, I think as conditioned souls, I can speak for myself, to maintain focus for extended periods of time can be difficult, but even to catch a few mantras or a round or two where the mind is actually in that state that you're talking about, that, that experience of relief is, is so profound and um, relieving. Really nice points and a nice verse. And just remembering Alice in Wonderland, I forget exactly how she enters into another world, but doesn't she go down a hole or something? Any experts? What? She goes down a rabbit hole? Yeah, so the, there's, once we go down the rabbit hole uh, and get into that flow, we can actually, we enter in a whole different world, and it's like, hey, wait a minute, I didn't know this was here. That, that's possible for the human to do. Uh, other animals can't do it. They're caught up in that maelstrom of survival. I have to do this. They're, they're forced by their senses. That's why we're lucky as humans. A couple more points. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, to continue off that point about uh, focus being a relief, it reminded me of the sutra you always say that focus is peace, but distraction is torture. And I was able to feel that just a few times today. Thank you. Jai. Yes. Pavani Bhakti, go ahead. Hare Krishna. Um, when you were saying about the Sambandha Gyan and you said that um, if we have a relationship with somebody, then we serve that person. I was thinking that uh, when we are chanting, we are actually serving Krishna. And it reminded me of something that I'm recently reading about Kardama Muni and uh, how he was serving Krishna for 10,000 years before getting married. And uh, in purport, Prabhupada says that um, Krishna has uh, unlimited desires and uh, devotee has unlimited appetite to serve his desires. 
so i was thinking um if we love krishna then we will have unlimited appetite to serve him because that's what he is and uh, so the chanting and every other service that we do is for krishna because we have a relationship with him and only if we have a relationship we can serve that person so it was really very deep uh, really appreciated it thank you maharaj he has such nice points it goes to the activity of the soul it's not that we be we become nothing or we stop our desires but it's that we apply our sense of desire to krishnendriya priti which is love for fulfilling the desires of krishna's senses which actually works the other one atmendriya priti doesn't work never works out uh, properly last night when we were reading from the third chapter of the adi lila together we came across that sentence in which uh, Kaviraj Goswami Prabhupada was elaborating on Kaviraj Goswami's point that there are four actual rasas that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught. Shanta Ras is not one of them that he emphasized because it's more of a neutral position. It's just sort of a general appreciation. But then there's a point at which one crosses over from that into a sense of like, well, let me do something for you. <laughs> Can I get you a glass of water? And once that happens, one goes into this uh, uh, loving reciprocation with Krishna. There's a reciprocation. And that's what's necessary to rise above the survival instinct of the material world. Let me serve Krishna. And then one feels the reciprocation. And the point that this is service, chanting Hare Krishna, it is a way of fulfilling Krishna's desire, is, is uh, extremely important. Okay, one more. Unamas or ek, mojido. Work with me, people. Okay. Jamuna has her hand up. Yes. Hi, Krishna Vaisheshikan. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Um, hi, Krishna, everyone. It's so nice to be in your association. Um, I, I really appreciate all that you said. And Sambandh, again, it's really amazing in this age of coral and hypocrisy, you can see there's so many distractions and it's so hard to actually um, focus. And I find japa is just, you can see why it's the main practice in our age, because it's such a deep, direct connection to Krishna. And it's like, I don't understand how people can live without chanting japa and understand what Krishna wants of them, because it's the direct way to have that relationship and find out, to hear from Krishna, what does he want from you? It, 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 it's like a direct connection in your heart. My grandma used to say, um, praying like cuts out the middleman. It's like the direct line. And I feel like chanting Japa, it just cuts out everything else. And it's your direct connection with Krishna. So as far as Sambandha again, I feel like Japa is just the, the direct, simple way every single day to connect directly with Krishna and find out what he wants of you. What, what is your gift, um, your service? Anyway, that's what I was thinking. And I was thinking as far as material um, responsibilities, Japa only makes those better. It makes you a better wife. It makes you a better mom. It makes you better at every other part materially. So uh, you have to add it to your life to actually even become better at your material responsibilities. That's what my experience is. Haribo. That's uh, confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita at 1010, where Prabhupada describes buddhi yoga and this way in which there's a very clear communication between Krishna and the soul. When one's in tune to Krishna's voice, praying to Krishna, and then getting this sense of direction from him. This is the process of buddhi yoga. And it's very real. Prabhupada says even if one doesn't have the intelligence to take advantage of a spiritual master, if it was very sincere, then one will get this sense of direction from Krishna. What to speak of when one's chanting japa. So we have a, a few more minutes. We'll chant for like five more minutes and then we'll get ready to greet the deities. Shri Harinam Prabhu Ki Jai. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Krishna.
And this brings to a close today's meeting of Make Japa Great Again. Dear Srila Prabhupada, dear Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Sri Panchatava, Sri Sri Gornitai, Sri Sri Radha Madan Mohan, Sri Sri Lakshmi Nishringadev, if you so desire, please instill in our hearts the clear idea that the most important service we have every day is to chant at least 16 rounds of great japa. Thank you for considering our request, Om Tat Sat. Everyone who agrees with this prayer in whole or in part, please unmute and say Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.